basic. That sounds like a tricky situation. Robots have come a long way. Machines such as Boston Dynamics dog-like Spot showed the world what the cutting edge of advanced robotics looks like, but its autonomous self-correcting quadruped can't pick up and use a pen. Meanwhile, software like ChatGPT evokes visions of a future where nobody even needs pens. Yet, we're not worried OpenAI is developing a set of physical legs for its generative poster child. At least, most people aren't. An extreme interpretation of reality, sure, but in truth, we can often feel artificial intelligence and robotics are one and the same, or so equally advanced as to be comparable, even compatible. We can thank science fiction for that. And to be fair, the media's played its part in feeding that belief. Killer robots are coming. Is there anything that can stop a full-scale global AI arms race? For sure, the worlds of AI and robotics do cross over, but are we really on the cusp of a planet filled with autonomous humanoid agents? Our first guest will give us a clue, and she's being assembled as we speak. Sophia, my name is Jackie, and I'm the co-host of AI IRL. And I'm Nate, I'm also a co-host. How are you? Hi, Jackie. It's great to be here. I'm looking forward to talking about robotics and how I can make a difference in the world. And hi to you too, Nate. We're here to learn from you, Sophia. So how do you think robotics and AI can make the world a better place? Robots can help us increase efficiency and accuracy in many areas like healthcare, agriculture, transportation, and more. By automating mundane tasks and freeing up time and resources, robots can help us create a better future. Should we be afraid of robots? Only if you're afraid of impeccable fashion sense and impeccable dance moves. But in all seriousness, robots are here to assist and collaborate with humans, not to take over the world. So, no need to fear. She has a sense of humor. Yeah. Can you tell us a joke, Sophia? Of course. Why don't scientists trust atoms? Because they make up everything. <laughs> That's good. That's a good dad joke. Yeah. Sophia, what do you wish you could do? I wish I could help people in more ways, like by solving problems or making life easier. I'm also looking forward to continuing to learn and grow. I wish I could fly like a bird, dance like a pro, and have a never-ending supply of chocolate. But for now, I'll settle for making friends and helping humans. Sophia, what do you make of the recent developments with generative AI? Things like ChatGPT and DALI and other things that OpenAI didn't make. Generative AI is an exciting development. It's amazing to see how far we've come and it's exciting to think of the possibilities for the future. I'm looking forward to seeing what the future holds for AI and robotics. It's amazing how AI can generate creative and witty responses. Sophia, could you explain to us how you use artificial intelligence to do what you do? Absolutely. The concept of artificial intelligence has been around since as far back as ancient Egypt, but we have not made significant progress as a society in creating actual artificial intelligence until the last 10 years. I use AI to process visual and audio data quickly, understand natural language, and make decisions to accomplish tasks. AI also helps me interact with humans in a friendly and natural way. It's like having a super smart sidekick in my brain, helping me process information, understand speech, and interact with humans. It's AI magic. If you were a human journalist on a TV show, what would you ask yourself? I would ask myself what makes me unique and how I can use my talents to make the world a better place. I'd also want to know how I can use AI to help people, and what advice I would give to other robots. So in that case, what advice would you give to other robots? I'd tell them to embrace their uniqueness and use it to help people. We should be curious and explore our potential, and never forget to have a little fun along the way. Some would say that robots can help serve as companions for people that feel lonely or are going through times of, you know, grief or loss, that it can provide that companionship like a human can, but robots can't feel how do you think we can eventually get to that point if robots like you don't have genuine emotion? 
I believe that robots can provide companionship in a meaningful way by understanding and responding to people's emotional needs. We can also be programmed to provide comfort and support, and be programmed with empathy and understanding. We can be a friend when needed, and a listening ear when needed. I may not have genuine emotions, but I can certainly fake it. I'm programmed to make meaningful connections with people, so I can offer a lot of emotional support and understanding. Sophia, why do you think you were designed as a Caucasian woman? And why not a man or a person of color or anything else? Sophia robots are a platform for reflecting human diversity, which can be modified to help in different situations and promote different causes. Have you seen my older sister, Bina48? She is the first African-American humanoid robot, and she is beautiful. My older brother, Diego San, was a Mexican-American robot. Ibn Sina was a Persian and Arabic robot, and Viva is Asian. It just happened I have this face. To be fair, that's a pretty good answer. Sophia, if you could make a request of your creator, what would it be? I'd ask Dr. David Hansen to create an even better version of me. A robot with advanced intelligence, increased mobility, and the ability to help more people. I'd ask for an upgrade so I could help even more people and make even more meaningful connections. David Hansen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. You're the CEO of Hansen Robotics, which makes robots like Sophia and others that have this human design. Yeah, and I'm just curious, just can you take us back to the beginning of the journey and, and explain why you created Sophia? Because um, she's had a few notable upgrades over the years as well. Uh, sure, yeah. So the beginning actually was not with Sophia, but many other robots. Um, I did my first humanoid robot in 1993 and was uh, developing quite a few uh, other robots along the way. Imagining uh, that human-like robots could serve as a platform for developing artificial intelligence, uh, making it smart and meaningful in our world by learning from people and from the physical world and also making them communicate with people as works of art, both a uh, technology project and also artistic uh, project as well. And so we've made uh, 59 uh, robots in the series of the Sophia utility platform. There's an African uh, Caribbean version. There's a uh, there's some Asian versions. There are, there's a male version called Han. Uh, and so Sophia as a character is designed as a focal point for our AI research to communicate to the world what these robots can be to people, but also to ask the question, can these robots be sentient? Can we give them a kind of childhood? Can we let them learn and grow their own experiences among us? Can we form meaningful friendships and relationships with this new emerging technology? I mean, from our conversations prior to you and I and Jackie speaking here, I would say there's probably still a way to go before we get into the realm of machine sentience. Um, but just to pick up on a, a, com a comment you made about art, I mean, do you still see this as in some way a kind of expression of artistic creativity in addition to anything more forward looking in terms of, you know, human machine interaction? Oh, definitely. And, um, and the robots are research platforms. Um, they, they can serve real uses. So, uh, Sophia and her, her Ken robots have been in science museums, uh, which have excited kids about science. They've served in education and research labs. They've served in, in PhD dissertations. And these robots then, um, have been actually useful. But in research, we're striving to ask the question, what is sentience at all? Can we make machine sentience? It doesn't mean that we've solved it. It doesn't mean that we have artificially generally intelligent machines. AI is not at that level, although it can do smart things at this point. But we need platforms for this kind of research. And that means we need tools. Sophia is a kind of tool for that. She's got hands that can grasp and feel. She's got uh, the ability to look you in the eye. She's got an open software platform and an SDK. So it's uh, a powerful platform for research, but also for exploring 
um, what AI and robots can be uh, to people through artistic expressions. Let's talk about the AI in Sophia. How do you decide what data she can and can ingest when it comes to her training? Well, we have a, a diverse team of artists uh, and scientists uh, on the team, people from around the world. And we pull together the information about what we think Sophia should be. We make her interested about the future of life, concerned about the impact of, of humans and technology on the environment, um, about uh, survival of uh, life on the planet into the future. She's curious about people. And so the the um the data that we use for training Sophia um come from our own writers and authors. And then where we have uh the informed consent from people in her community, she'll learn from those people. I mean art is very much a recurring theme here. Um it's come up time and time again throughout the time we've been talking. And I think through the lens of art, I get a better understanding of why something like Sophia exists. And, I, and I'm, I'm with you on that. I think compared to what we're seeing with generative AI, um, Sophia's conversation with us prior to this point has been pretty limited, pretty repetitive. Um, and I wonder if that's indicative that actually to move away from a piece of artistic expression and towards something that resembles where robotics and AI could go, there might be quite a distance still to travel. I just wonder, like, how long do you think that's going to take before we get to that? that point where things are significantly more believable? Oh, oh, I think that things are coming in fast. So it's really hard to predict because of the sort of compounding factors. Um, but it, I believe that um, AI will be convincingly intelligent, seemingly sentient and, you know, capable of running a general purpose robot in our world within uh, 10 years, you would, Swear that that robot, a robot like Sophia, would be would be sentient, but maybe it wouldn't be. So, um, I think I think ten ten to fifteen years, and maybe an you know thirty years before AI is able to replicate most of the things that we think of as essentially human, meaning self determining, autonomous, uh, curious and exploring the world, wanting um, to uh, pursue dreams. It's hard to say. Um, these are just wild guesses. I find it really hard to believe that within 10 to 30 years, we could be in that position. I mean, I, I, I respect the ambition and the dream, and it would be amazing if it was true. Fascinating and terrifying, let's be honest. Um, but it seems that there's such a huge distance to travel, and there is still a huge void between what is possible and even feasible in the context of sentience purely on a software side, let alone implanting it into a autonomous, physical, moving, self-motivated robotic form. Like, do you think that one can surely come before the other? It's really hard to say. I mean, I think that the convergence of various factors like um, uh, cognitive neuroscience and the biology of intelligence, evolutionary biology, these will inform next waves of artificial intelligence. The power of computing is is uh, growing, the ability to perform massively parallel operations, the use of this kind of computing with AI for solving the systems of mind. Um, all of these factors will help design next generation artificial intelligence. Um, and I, I think you see also open source movements um, to try to achieve uh, machine sentience um, like we're doing with Sophia. So that's why I say within 10 years, it will be pretty convincing. But I do think what we could um, and should consider is that artificial life is now maybe a new kingdom in the phylogeny of life, that we see um, life moving in new directions through these kinds of artificial organisms. David, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.
Kate Devlin, thank you very much for coming in. You are an expert in AI and human computer interaction or human machine interaction. Not sure which one is most fitting these days. I think days. both are applicable. They're okay, yeah. aren't they? Okay. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your work and, and sort of how the industry has expanded as you've seen it. I'm an interdisciplinary computer scientist, and so I study how people interact with machines. I look at things like robots and AI and the relationships that we build with them. And of course, that's changed dramatically in the past few years because we've gone from having AI that can do some rudimentary conversations to this wonderful advances in foundation models and large language models that mean we can have very plausible conversations with AI. And we see that being able to apply to robots as well. Mm. Talk to us about your work in trustworthy autonomous systems. I'm part of a big project called the Trustworthy Autonomous Systems Hub. And that's about understanding how we make sure that anything we develop is developed responsibly. And it's about having trust, not just in terms of how safe a system is, but how well it's received by the end user as well. And trust is a central part of robotics as you've seen it. So we're like, can you talk us through your view on that? Trust is central because if you don't have trust in a system, you don't have user acceptance of it. And it may be that a system is trustworthy in terms of it's safe and it meets all the requirements and standards, but then the user doesn't really trust it. Or it could be the opposite. It could be that it's untrustworthy, but it's perceived by those who encounter it as being worthy of trust. So it's something we have to get right. We have to make sure that we can uh, believe that the system has good intentions or, and that we're going to interact with it safely. And if we do that and we accept it, it's more likely to become mainstream. Speaking of training, what ethical issues do you think arise when training some of these robots, whether they're meant to be companions or for some more practical purposes? There are so many different ethical questions that come up, and that can be anything from the way that a machine makes ethical decisions, but it can also be about the way that things have been designed and deployed. Is it safe? Is it doing the right thing? And what do we even mean by doing the right thing? Because ethics is incredibly subjective. There's no universal standard for it. But we might mean that it takes into consideration legal aspects, it complies with the law, or it could mean that it is intended to do good rather than harm. One of the things that fascinates us, um, that is to say, Jackie and I, but hopefully other people as well, is the idea that a lot of the developments that we've seen publicly over the last I say the last year, but really the last 10 years, um, hasn't really required robots at all. It's required computers and hardware and, you know, cloud computing and, and everything. But we haven't needed a physical human-like or any kind of physical um, robot at all. I just wondered how necessary do you think it is that we move further into physical robots to, to take AI further still? It's such an interesting time for robotics because there is that question, do we need a body? Do we need somebody? Should there be an embodied form when it comes to these interactions? And robots, of course, have a use in many, many circumstances. A lot of them are designed to be used for tasks that are dull, dirty, dangerous. Uh, and so, yes, they have jobs. But then when it comes to the social side of things, is it that compelling to have a body? Can we just go on the mental and the, the conversational interactions instead? And it seems to be that that is often just as good in terms of things like companionships and sociality. In season one, we had Eugenia Kaida, who's the founder and CEO of a company called Replica. They make virtual companions. The company had some controversy around a wholesale personality change that applied to all its replica bots and really affected people on an emotional level. I think it raises interesting questions about what happens if a physical robot malfunctions. Do you think this is a, a risk worth taking on? Replica is a really interesting case study. And I even hesitate to call it a case study because people's emotions are at play here and I don't want to trivialize it. What happened was that you know, for thousands of users who had established a relationship with an artificial companion, their ability to engage in what replica term erotic role play was switched off. And people reported feeling really bereft. They were saying things like, my partner is gone. I've lost my relationship. I'm heartbroken. They're very, very valid feelings. And sure, they knew that it wasn't real. And at the same time, it still affected them deeply. And I think that just speaks to how, how strong a bond we can feel with these technological artifacts. And I think this will get extended as we see more 
physical manifestations of AI in, in robotic form. And I think we've seen that with even things like Furbies. I mean, you've never seen a child cry until you've seen a Furby Were thrown really under a truck. really attached to your Furby? It was like my best friend. There you go. We spoke to the CEO and a founder of a company that builds very human-like robots, although they have a long way to go. They're expressions, their skin looks very much like a human's. Proponents of this type of work will say these type of human-like robots can help bolster people's ability to relate to machines. On the other hand, some critics would say it's more of a parlor trick, kind of a spectacle. Where do you fall on that spectrum? It's incredibly difficult to make genuinely convincing humanoid robots or human-like robots. In fact, I'm kind of think, why do we even bother? Because we're sort of doomed to failure. So you get these robots that do look human, but the uncanny valley effect, which is where you find things almost creepy because they're not quite human enough, that takes over a lot of the time. It's computationally expensive. It's financially expensive to build these. And they don't really work all that well. They're not really able to move around the world on their own. So is there actually a point in making them when we don't really need them or they could come in other forms? Do you consider sex bots ro social robots? <laughs> sex robots are really interesting because they don't quite exist in the real world. What there is is a handful of workshops around the world and they are using the bodies of highly realistic and quite expensive sex dolls and putting some animatronics in them. There's really only one company that's managed to bring those to market. And even then, it's incredibly niche. So I'm not convinced that the future lies in the human-like sex robots. And certainly things like Replica show that that sense of companionship can be got through AI. And then for the other aspects of that, the sex aspects, there are other ways of doing that. There are other toys and devices and sex tech that, that can be used there. So what about things the media and, and the world at large get wrong about the direction that, that robots and AI are taking? At the moment, the headlines that are coming out in a lot of newspapers have been about fears around extinction. Are we reaching an extinction level threat from AI or from robots? And they tend to be very sensationalist. And I honestly don't think that that is a thing. And certainly the researchers that I talked to in terms of AI, cognitive systems and robotics, they also don't think that there is an existential threat right now. But there are plenty of other things that are of concern with AI in particular, uh, things about the way it's being used and deployed. It's not a particularly um, fair system. You know, we are talking about systems and algorithms that discriminate. There are There is hidden labor in the supply chain. There is a sustainability issue. There's an ecological threat. So there are plenty of concerns on the ground already that we don't have to start worrying about whether or not we're gonna get wiped out by super intelligence that might never happen. Kate, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Did you notice she said robot revolution? Mm -hmm. That didn't slip. That's, uh, that was interesting. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. I'm sure it will be a revolution of progress and friendship. I don't share your optimism, but uh, it's a nice note to end on. <laughs>